So Hugh had a question. Hugh has obviously gotten both the bottom game app and the top game app because he's asking as far as guard retention goes, mm -hmm. which is preventing people from passing your guard, how do you deal with an opponent who's good at using the top game tactics, such as a windshield wiper, the top spin, the hip switch, and so on? So he's really asking, how do you counter the good guard passing techniques and good guard passing strategies? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, the first thing you have to do is get really, really strong and really, really flexible, because that's the only way to be good at jujitsu. I'm obviously no. joking. Uh, the, the, uh, the, they're, they're complementary apps. So uh, the idea isn't that you know, the, the top game is the superior way, and if you just learn the techniques to the top game, you'll be able to beat the bottom game guy. Right. Although I would always argue that the bottom person is at a slight disadvantage despite what you know, we're taught mm -hmm. in jiu-jitsu. Um, when you add the element of striking and different rule sets and things sure. like that, the bottom is not where you want to be, so it's always incumbent on the bottom person to be and to, to more directly answer the question, it is incumbent on you to react early, often, and maintain constant vigilance regarding positioning, grips, angles, things like right. that. So if somebody gets, you know, devotes a lot of time to getting good at the top game passing stuff, and you're just kind of relying on the fact that you can stick your feet in here and you know, get to base and be lazy about it, uh, and escape your hips and highlight do all the movements, um, Definitely, that's not going to work. But the greater an understanding you have of the top game movement, so if you really learn how to do those passes, you're going to know where are the gaps, where are the opportunities for the other person to move their hips, to set a frame, to access a lever, uh, to recompose their hip angle, things like that, all the things that we discussed in the app. Um, understanding, deeply understanding offense makes defending it much easier. Mm -hmm. So I can't give you just an easy, oh, well, if a guy's just really good at those moves, then you just use these moves because that's not really how any of this stuff works. Right. It's it, the, the guy has a good understanding of how to make grips. You have to have a good understanding of how to fight and break grips, which right. we kind of went over. Right. Um, if the guys that you're dealing with are good at you know using a particular you know, whether it's a hip switch or a, you know a hip switch involves a certain amount of momentum that's being generated. So if you understand the concept of momentum and center of gravity, you'll be able to apply that to how can I respond? You know, if there's, uh, you know, if somebody's using a top spin, same thing. There is a certain amount of uh, center of gravity shift. There are levers that exist, so you, you have to have enough of an understanding. But, of, but it's all doesn't matter if there's not the recognition that the guy's about, about to do a to do top spin. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so, so that only comes from learning. If you if you want to get good at the bottom, you do have to learn the top. Yeah. Because the fastest way to learn to defend something is to learn to do it yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean that's. When I was uh, reading that out to you, the thing that came to my mind was how Eric Paulson, one of my coaches, got good at leg locks. And he was taught leg locks because he was going to go fight in Japan, and the Japanese at the time were leg lock crazy. Yeah. And so they started teaching his Shuto instructors, Yuri Nakamura mostly, started teaching him leg locks so that he would recognize and be able to defend uh, the leg locks that he was inevitably going to run into. Yeah, and I, this is actually one of the this sort of bridges into another topic, which is... Uh, using teaching as a method of becoming better mm -hmm. as a practitioner. I know anytime I uh, learn something, I'm learning it with the intent of teaching it to my students. Uh, and so every time I you know, rep a technique or investigate a technique even, or an approach, I'm trying to think of, okay, how does this affect different body types, different skill levels, things like that. And then as I teach it, I'm forced to understand it better. The better I understand it, the better I'm able to do it. So even techniques that I don't personally use very often or games that I don't personally use very often, I've massively increased my proficiency with them just by teaching them to people. Right. So not that I'm suggesting that every white belt out there actually run around yeah, and but teach people. Yeah, the white belt teacher. Yeah, we, I'm not talking to you. Yeah, yeah. please, for God, stop. Yeah. Uh, I've got you guys at my academy. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> You're paying me to teach. You're not paying your white belt partner to teach you how to do a barambolo. God. Which is different from helping him out. Yeah, no, I don't but, yeah, obviously, yeah. but I mean, there are some chronic teachers. I mean, now we're going down another point. Now. Yeah. There are some chronic teachers out there in the martial arts who cannot practice a technique five times without stopping and going off to teach somebody else. Yeah. Just stop, train yourself, you know, yeah. first improve yourself. Okay, let's drag this slowly <laughs> back. back. Yes. <laughs> So really, our suggestion to 
to Hugh is to practice a top game. Mm -hmm. And really, I mean, how do you beat a better guard passer is to improve your guard retention, guard retention skills yeah. and get better at applying yeah. those same motions. Because it's not like the super elite guys are all said, oh, oh yeah, I used to use all that stuff and now I use this totally secret set of techniques. No, they're not. They're using the same stuff that, yeah. that we showed. They, what they are doing it with is superior timing, superior right. understanding of you know, leverage, body mechanics, things like that. And, you know, frankly, insanely superior athleticism to any of us. But the people they're performing it on, that's not a factor. Right. So they, you can't say, oh, that guy's got great guard retention because he's such an awesome athlete. Well, so is the guy he's facing in the finals of the Mundials, right? right. So we, we, we can kind of eliminate that as a factor at that level. So we, we have to recognize, and once we've eliminated that, okay, there's got to be something to the inherent movements being efficient. So if you just get good at the timing of it, they are going to work. And I would argue that the best way, like the, the low-hanging fruit on timing is early recognition. Yes. I mean, there is timing and there is reaction speed and all that can be improved slowly. But if you know for a fact yeah. that if you touch me in the face, that I'm going to punch you here. Exactly. That if you, you can look like you have amazing timing and because, bang. oh, look at that, exactly. Yeah. Oh, death punch. Yeah. Because um, you recognize it. You, you know it's coming. So you don't actually need to be have super fast reaction skills. Or exactly. And, and that's something we did touch on in the... Um, in the guard, uh, the, 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 the modes or phases of guard right. section, which is recognizing when you are in the engagement phase, right. recognizing when you are in the maintenance or attacking phase, and when you are in the retention phase. Uh, and that is something that, I mean, that, that takes a lot of mat time. I, I know people have asked about that, you know, how do I recognize what, you just got to do it. You have to, you know, have the definitions that sets the parameters in your mind so that you can actually recognize it. Because without those definitions, you know, it's something that, how do you know when to do a guard retention movement? Well, somebody has to tell you that it's guard retention time. Right. And once you've got that definition down, then you can perform the guard oh. retention movements. Well, the definitions definitely clarify thinking and clarify training and clarify, I mean, it, it's, it sounds really eggheady, but without having the words or the vocabulary to discuss things, you don't even have the words or vocabulary to think about think, it yourself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, language does determine the nature of ideas. Uh, you know, like I know people who have, uh, you know, English as a second language, and they just they're they're not even able to engage, uh, you know, certain ideas if they're using that language. But if they're speaking or thinking in the other language, they they're, they're actually smarter. They're literally smarter in a different language than they are uh, in a second language. So yeah, if you don't have ideas or you know words to to create ideas, those ideas can't exist. So use your words. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lend this with you with your words. You know what? Actually, I'm glad you brought I actually uh, have something that I suggest to students all the time when they're drilling, which is particularly if you're drilling alone. I don't know when I say alone. I mean like with a partner, not in class. Um, but whispering or even just you know, in your mind speaking the steps of the movement. Some people just kind of go through a movement. You know, I would say if I was going to drill an arm drag, grab the meat of the thumb. Punch the hand to the hip, grip the lever, you know, of the elbow. Extend your legs, swing it as a pendulum, scoot your hips. I know when I drill stuff that's new to me, I actually go through those things to set the the proper neural pathways. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, you use your words. It, it does help.